This conference uh, will now be recorded. Okay. Uh, can you see the title slide? Paul? Yes, I can. Yeah. Excellent. Yes, We're in yes, control. Yes, I can then. see the title slide. Yes. Sorry, okay. I thought I was mute for a moment. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, what we're going to uh, go through over the next uh, half an hour to 40 minutes, and it could be either or because uh, our rehearsals have been varied over the uh, internet. Uh, we're going to give an overview of rail regulation, uh, what we do in the OOR, what uh, regulators are, how we see the railway as a system, how we fit into that, and what our regulatory responsibilities are and how we execute them. Uh, but first of all, I'll let Steve introduce himself and then I'll introduce myself and we'll get straight into the presentation then. Yeah, thanks, Dermot. It's a, <clears throat> we hope this to be uh, an entertaining and informative presentation. Um, we are going to be a bit like the two Ronnies in the sense of us sharing the presentation through the slides. Maybe not as funny as the two Ronnies, but we'll mm -hmm. see. Um, so I'm Steve Fletcher. I'm Deputy Director in ORR. And I work within the economic department with a dotted line to safety. Um, my career today, 30 years in construction, started life as a civil engineer in heavy civil engineering contracting at Sizewell B, did plenty of railway jobs and worked on the second seven crossing for three years. And then fed up with traveling around the country, moved to loss adjusting with a civil engineering perspective and thoroughly enjoyed that, which was really exciting. To then land in Network Rail, who I worked for for 10 years, um, with a stint of three years in Saudi Arabia. Um, and I am truly now and 100% a railway man through and through. I think like most people, certainly in the PWI and who work in the railway industry, it does get under your skin and it's a passion and a vocation and not job. Um, and having enjoyed my time at Network Rail, I felt it was time and opportunity for me to move to the Office of Rail and Road, where I head up engineering um, and asset management, uh, together with um, a review of enhancements programmes and uh, Roland stock. Um, on behalf of Ian Prosser, I'm a signatory for um, bringing, uh, providing authority for bringing new infrastructure and rolling stock into service. And I'm finding, and I hope you'll hear, um, that the, the work that we do is very broad, very exciting, and um, I believe we have a great deal of value. Dermot. Okay, and uh, my name is Dermot Kelly. I've been with the OOR for 18 months now. My railway career started in December 86 on London Underground, and uh, since then I've gone through London Underground, Mass Transit Railway in Hong Kong, uh, Balfour BT, Grand Rail, Carillion, uh, and now the OOR. So first slide, uh, Steve's gonna tell you about what a regulator is and what, reg what a regulator does. Yes, thanks, Dermot. So, um, the regulatory authorities are commonly set up to enforce safety and standards and to protect consumers in the markets where there's a lack of effective competition um, or potential for the undue exercise of market power. Uh, and Network Rail do that. We, we, we do that with a, I think it's reasonably unique, Dermot, where we actually set the um, uh, the determination which lays out what network rail are expected to deliver and yes, hold them to account to that. Yeah, I think we're unique in that we've got safety and economic uh, regulatory responsibilities. Absolutely. Uh, so that's the regulator. A uh, bit of talk about our history now. <laughs> so, so it did make me laugh uh, and um, steal one of Dermot's jokes for the absence of doubt George Stevenson was not referring to high speed two when he references wild and visionary schemes in this quote on this slide um, and I thought it's an opportunity to actually mention a book that only recently came out last year which makes reference to Her Majesty's Railway Inspectorate which enjoyed its 175th anniversary last year uh, and the book covers a period from 1840 um, which is remarkable, and okay. um, yes, it's a, okay. it's a 
been a long time in in, in its uh, being, albeit named a few different things. Okay. And uh, in our next section, we go on to talk about uh, the railways as system, so that uh, you get a feel for where regulation sits in within the railway system. Yeah, so if you can pick up on this slide so they don't bore themselves with our my monotone. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, the railway in some ways hasn't changed that much over 200 years. If you go back to our earliest timetable there, uh, it was on paper, printed on paper back then, uh, but last week you can get it on uh, the internet, but it gives you the same information, uh, a time and a cost for a ticket. Uh, and that's remained fairly constant as a uh, de defining feature of our industry. So uh, the demand we have uh, has remained the same, the product is the same, uh, but it's quite a complex system. We've got controls con uh, which uh, determine how we work, which can be legislation, uh, rules, access agreements, uh, procedures, policies, uh, and we uh, they control how we work. And then we've got resources we would use for our work, which could be people, plant, labour and equipment. Uh, and all of that works in uh, the environment uh, we, our industry is in. When you start to delve down into it a bit more, you can start to see it gets uh, a lot more complex. Uh, and the more complex it gets, the more interfaces we have between disciplines. Uh, and you, you start to see how things become very complicated and how one uh, influence can start to affect all the other disciplines and affect the output. Uh, so, Dan, if I can just add to that. Um... So, so if you imagine the demand uh, has increased somewhat, um, it's very much the same outputs in terms of the timetable. Um, but the de demand is massive, uh, and compared to the early days, uh, and technologies have advanced greatly. And, and given the demand and the changing technology, that brings about uh, a more complex system to be controlled, and therefore the controls have matured to meet that those complexities and the environment, not uh, uh, as Demet is alluding to, uh, uh, has matured and more complex, but the natural environment is also making uh, the job for Network Rail and uh, us as a regulator uh, so much more difficult and unpredictable. Do you want to mention something, Steve, about all these different interfaces in the uh the background environment of industry organizations and funders and the entities we regulate and the difficulty uh, or, or the interest in trying to balance all these competing demands and influences on us? Yeah, so, so we're appointed by Parliament to hold Network Rail to account to ensure that it provides a safe railway and um, best performance for the best value for our taxpayer. Uh, that's very clear, and that's laid out in, in our licences. Um, but as you would imagine, and as showed on this slide, the changing environment, the stakeholders in this um, are many. And we've got the rail delivery group that's rep representing train operators uh, and network rail, and we've got RAVE who are focused on standards and on um, research. And then you've got the, non, the varying types of railway infrastructure managers, not just Network Rail, but there's uh, Eurotunnel. Last year we did a great deal of work on High Speed One. And we also fulfil a role in terms of safety on transport for London. And um, the world of trams and metros is now moving at a pace where regulation is becoming stronger than ever before. And, and it has been mature, but that we're turning a corner now in that respect and we spend a great deal of time I noticed there there's a sign for RIA which represents the supply chain uh, and the industry is learning control period after control period um, and part of the lessons um, from our previous control periods have been that we've not engaged I say we network rail the, in, the duty holders and the regulators have not engaged sufficiently well with the supply chain 
to enable us to understand to greater depth what's deliverable, what the capability gaps are, that sort of thing. And so now um, we are very active with RIA network rail and the suppliers to, to, to assess what the current situation is and to see um, the breadth of um, work that's being undertaken, what's being planned and, and to assess the capability. Okay. So we'll move on now actually to, so that gives, it describes the environment we work in, the complex industry uh, situation we have. And now we'll talk a little bit about the OOR itself. Uh, so Steve, do you want to talk about our context? Yeah, so um, our context, so we are 300 strong in it, and in Dermot's team, there's six people. Um, and we're interfacing with an organization network rail that's got 40,000 people um uh, and managing 20,000 miles of track and as you can see I'm not going to read all the the figures um it's an enormous task for such a small body of people and the bulk of the regulators headcount resource is focused on health and safety and we have an inspectorate where inspectors are out in the field um uh, undertaking their health and safety executive type duties um, but the smaller portion of individuals, namely Dermot and myself and our colleagues in the economic side, um, are required to assess the delivery of network rails plans, the delivery plan, you know, renewals and, and maintenance activities, uh, and to determine and validate the proposals made by network rail for future spend in other control periods. Okay. So we are for you and we are dependent on experts and very strong collaboration and engagement with key individuals within that way around. Okay, so as a comparison, uh, Offwatt have about 300 staff, uh, Offgem and Offcom 900, and uh, so we're closer to the Gambling Commission, which uh, actually has 355 full-time employees. And I would say that uh, Network Rail, it's not a lottery uh, at all, Dermot. Um, they are very good at what they do um, as we hold them to account to. Okay, uh, but pe people are often curious about how we're actually funded. Uh, and uh, we're funded by license fees and safety levies, uh, almost entirely through Network Rail's license fee. Uh, yeah. For roads, part of us, well, we are, uh, for, our road operation is funded directly by the DFT, I believe, Steve? Yes, and that's on an actual, not through a licence fee, it's actually related to the time and in, um, input into undertaking our duty to, to monitor the roads um, part of the world, yes. Okay, so now if we get, get more into our organisation a bit, uh, do you want to talk us through this, Steve? Yeah, so the key to Office of Rail and Road is the fact that um, it's not a part of the ministerial government department. It's completely independent of government. We are employed by or instructed by Parliament to independently assess the economic aspects and, and safety elements of regulation on British railways. Um, and also we undertake the economic monitoring of how is England, we don't fulfil a safety role in that area, do we Dermot? No. Um, mm. and the, the key departments there are, are highlighted, so Dermot and I are part of the Railway Planning and Performance and Highways section of ORR and there is overlap so the overlap with the economics markets and strategy is very strong particularly through a periodic periodic review which we may touch on a bit later where we um assess how much money is required well a certain amount of money is made available by the government and, we, and it's our task we're never able to make sure that the best outcomes as a result of that funding are, are identified and, and planned through and we do that very closely with our economics and markets and strategy people. Um, those people also look at competition uh, and elements of the consumer. The railway safety is what it says on the tin and our, our inspectors are around the country uh, and are widely respected and well known. 
And then the obviously the general counsel competition and legal services. We have a very good expert legal team. You can imagine that the we can get wrapped up in the Gordian knot around the legal requirements of a license. Um, but also um, there are people within the private sector that may um, decide upon themselves that they want to take us to task. And so it's necessary for ORR to be highly astute in the in the world of legality. And then, of course, we've got our communications department, which um, all organisations of a similar certain size have and fulfil and that and they enable us to communicate internally and externally with our stakeholders and help promote what we do. OK. Uh, so uh, our vision, uh, do you want to talk us through this, Steve? Um, yeah, so sure. So, so it's necessary for us to secure value for money. Um, uh, and how do we do that? A lot of work has gone in in CP5 to prepare Network Rail for CP6. CP6 is the sixth control period, uh, which spans five years where Network Rail are delivering their work. And of course, people lament at the cost of things in the railway. And it's our job with Network Rail, um, well, it's our job to independently hold Network Rail to deliver to best value. Um, and that means not necessarily delivering some things if they're not necessary. And a great deal of effort goes in to assessing the requirements of the railway, whether it be a new service or whether it would be maintaining the infrastructure as is and ensuring that its condition and its ability to perform is sustained. Uh, and we put a lot of emphasis to ensuring that money that is secured is spent to best value. And that, that's a foundation and, and well within our DNA. Um, and as also is better service for customers, and you should be aware of um, the transition of network rail, it's called putting passenger first, but it's putting passenger and freight first, actually. Um, and I think that correction was made to be fair. And what we try to do is to ensure that network rail duty holders that we hold to account, I should say, Dermot, um, actually, deliver value for money but deliver it in such a way that they provide the optimal service for its customers and then thirdly and we will often repeat this we don't do anything without taking good countenance of safety okay uh so we have to abide by the regulators code uh which uh that came into effect in 2014 and uh, it uh, spells out how a, a regulator should behave and uh, nearly all regulators including local authorities fire and rescue authorities must have regard to it when developing policies and procedures and uh, the same applies to us so it can be simplified down essentially to six ticks uh, so we have to carry out our activities in a way that supports uh, compliance and growth with those we regulate uh, we have to provide simple and straightforward ways to engage with those we regulate and hear their views uh, and get their feedback. Uh, all of our activities are based on risk, uh, whether that's on the safety side of our operation or indeed even uh, on the civil engineering and track side. Uh, we have to share information we have about compliance and risk. And uh, overall, we have to ensure that all our information is clear, guidance is clear, and advice is uh, available to help people meet their responsibilities. And uh, we have to be transparent, which is uh, uh, quite important, uh, which that then means uh, we have to establish uh, values uh, and uh, encourage them to be applied throughout the OOR. Uh, so we, we're inclusive. Uh, we include and support each other. We're ambitious and innovative. Uh, we value expertise and professionalism, and we uh, are always working to collaborate uh, effectively, uh, which then takes us to the point where we ask you a question. And it, what's nice about this question is uh, it sort of answers itself. Uh, why do you think you want an independent regulator? Uh, and uh, maybe we'll come back to that in the uh, questions sense. Uh, but 
it does answer itself in a multi-million pound, multi-stakeholder, public-facing industry, why might the following be essential? Uh, we have to be seen uh, and we have to have systems in place to show that we, we behave and act objectively, impartially, impartially and consistently. Uh, we must have no conflict of interest, no bias or no undue influence. Uh, uh, so what what we do? Uh, so uh, health and safety, uh, the OOR is the health and safety enforcing authority for the rail industry. Uh, our railway inspectorate carries out the necessary inspections and certifications and investigates uh, those responsible for any breach of health and safety legislation. Uh, we engage with duty holders to ensure good health and safety on the railways and we report annually on that topic uh, and hopefully you'll have seen our uh, he annual health and safety report published in July. Uh, we drive cost efficiency, performance and competition. We hold Network Rail to account for how it spends millions of taxpayers' money uh, each year efficiently. Uh, we do this by regulating Network Rail's stewardship of the rail network and hold Network Rail to account for delivery against an agreed plan. Uh, it's including its obligation to provide passengers with uh, a punctual and reliable service. Uh, we publish annual reports on how Network Rail is delivering against these priorities. Uh, and we support UK economic growth and sector innovation by ensuring the country's passenger and freight markets are open to effective competition uh, and our EM, uh, economics markets and strategy people intervene where that appears not to be the case. Uh, we deliver key processes for the industry such as uh, ensuring fair access to the rail network and we authorise new trains and infrastructure. Uh, these processes support the industry and the railway network as a whole uh, and all the users of the rail network and uh, we, the reports and statistics we produce are Office of National Statistics accredited uh, so they've got uh, quite a bit of credibility. Uh, we undertake uh, a range of work to protect users' interests uh, and support better customer service for all passengers. Uh, we require operating companies to ensure passengers can take safe and reliable journeys and uh, we uh, ensure that the interests of freight users are taken into account uh, on the railway. And Dermot, we don't can, we do. go back? Uh, can I just go back and, and just mention in the context of track um, we liaise very closely with Network Rail and their technical authority um, responsible for setting policies and we test and validate those policies themselves as part of the periodic review. But we continuously engage with Network Rail's route asset managers, their track specialists um, to ensure that um, standards are, are being adhered to, that plans are being delivered um, and that suitable uh, mitigations are in place for whatever risk that exists uh, and it's a day-to-day -day engagement that we have with Network Rail across the whole of the country including Scotland and Wales. Okay, uh, so what we don't do, uh, uh, so we don't set rail fares or penalty fares, we don't award the contracts to train companies, we don't manage the daily operations of train companies over railway. Uh, we don't manage the railway timetable. We don't deal with complaints about train companies. Uh, and uh, we have nothing to do with the prices at station car parks. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, but getting more into the detail in the engineering here, uh, we, we, we don't set absolute targets or mi micromanage those who regulate, nor do we mandate special, specific schemes or investments. However, uh, our independent status allows us to share unbiased challenges with Network Rail and introduce uh, different perspectives. So we, we don't write asset policies or standards. 
uh, but we can review and challenge them if we see fit. Yeah. And that yeah. could emerge as part of our uh, business as usual work. And uh, we don't mandate particular technical innovations or developments, but we would ask and we would challenge on what is best practice and that's what we'd expect. Uh, and <clears throat> any, anything else on this, Steve, in particular? Um, no, so on the, the point of innovations, we wouldn't um, determine what they innovate on, but we would be very challenging if we felt they were not innovative uh, and not developing those new technologies for the best value uh, and best efficiency and best service for the customer. Uh, and the only other point I would make, Dermot, is um, we will delve into the detail to its lowest common denominator if we feel it's necessary and depending on risk as you say and the impact to either safety or an, an economic a detrimental economic perspective okay uh so would we also regulate railway next work, uh, network separate to the national network operated by network rail uh, including the channel tunnel high speed one and we have a limited role in regulating the railway in northern ireland and uh we exist or exert considerable influence with government and industry as well as holding significant economic enforcement powers uh, these are most visible through the imposition of a fine uh, for example such as we levied on the train companies for per passenger information uh, during disruption after the may 2018 timetable failures however uh, culturally our emphasis is on early intervention uh, and this is this is true of all our activities. Uh, we would seek to identify evidence and remedy a problem transparently uh, before a fine becomes necessary. Uh, however, much goes on behind the scenes and produces a positive result. Where that doesn't produce a result, uh, the process to escalate uh, exists, and that would start with. Uh, information advice we give a verbal or written warning of potential non-compliance uh, if that doesn't work we'd move on to an improvement plan uh, we give encouragement to make specific improvements within a set time scale uh, then we get on to orders where we make an order to do something to remedy the problem for example a, a license breach uh, and then finally uh, fines we can impose fines on companies uh, but it's rare that we do that things are escalated to that degree. It's usually uh, addressed before that. And these details can be very complex in nature. For example, train performance in Northwestern Central um, was just absolutely dire. And I think people may be aware of issues around May 18. It was very um, well covered in the media, uh, and things just didn't appear to be going too well in the West Midlands and. Uh, the Northern Corridor was just continuing to be a nightmare. And so we had to take the decision to escalate our holding to account uh, and kick in our policy, new policy for the first time, which meant that the various experts from each of the disciplines, whether it be training, operations, track, asset management, um, were set a remit to crawl, let's say, crawl over Northwestern Central to assess in all avenues that could have a detrimental impact on uh, train performance and to understand why uh, services were so poor and then that resulted in, uh, and the objective of that was to make sure that network rail the region specifically northwestern central was identifying all the causes and setting those appropriate plans that Dermot has just referred to and then having um, completed our review investigation we produced a report which was published uh, and we are holding that we fortunately uh, Northwestern Central had identified the key factors that were influencing train performance uh, and as a result of that we produced a series of recommendations that were very much based on their plans for improvement and we are holding them to account against that if they continue to fail and if they um, do not sustain efforts on their own planning we will escalate it to the next level which will be a public hearing but I'm hopeful that will not be necessary, Dermot. No, indeed. Uh, okay, uh, if we go on to uh, civil engineering now, uh, and TRAC is part of our civil engineering team, uh, and 
track is the uh, common thread between uh, our civil engineering disciplines. So within the civil engineering team in uh, the OOR, uh, we've got a, a number of disciplines, uh, track, which uh, uh, PWI will obviously be w well aware of. Uh, this includes uh, SNC as well as uh, plain line. Uh, you've also got uh, earthworks and drainage, and uh, earthworks embankments, cuttings, and other foundation are the foundations of a railway uh, created using soil and rocks. And clearly, failure of earthworks uh, can include substance or slips, uh, drainage concerns, and management of water, uh, which we're all aware of. And good drainage improves and maintains railway performance. Uh, and so, it's uh, with these disciplines we monitor the cost and volume, what Network Rail promised, what they're delivering against that promise, uh, and the costs. Uh, after EarthWorks and drainage, we also uh, monitor and hold Network Rail to account on st structures, tunnels, and mining, and uh, operational property, which uh, are uh, buildings which provide accommodation, shelter, or access for customers, or they, they house uh, relay rooms, uh, maintenance depots, and other assets uh, that house critical equipment. So th the common thread through all of that, really, which ties all of those together is uh, the track. Uh, we've also got responsibilities for line side, which is becoming uh, ever more important with uh, changing climate, uh, the uh, vegetation, as you can imagine, is reacting to the cl uh, climate as well. And uh, it, it's a discipline which can have uh, a big impact on signal sighting, rail adhesion, encroachment to the overhead line equipment uh, or the uh, trees blowing over. Uh, so, Steve, uh, can you tell us a bit about authorizations, then? Yeah, so um, authorizations are actually linked to the interoperability regulations, which which are a, a Europe, which are a European regulation, which has been transposed into um, British regulation as part of Brexit. Um, and I might add, uh, take this opportunity to say that we're not changing them, certainly not straight away, anyway. But there will be some opportunity in specific areas where. The European generic approach to uh, the interoperable standards specifications, I should say, didn't weren't a best fit for the way we operate the railway in the UK. So there should be some refinement to that. But in principle, we're going to retain our um, visibility of developments within Europe. We're going to keep in contact with Europe, but we're going to apply it through British legislation. And what is the, what are the authorizations? So every time that um, you bring new infrastructure into service, um, there's a requirement to test its significance. Uh, and I mentioned as part of the opening on this that interoperability regulations are an economic thing and not a safety thing per se. Although the common safety method, the method of assessing risk, is adopted consistently throughout Europe and forms part of the regulations, and that's what we do in the UK. But the driver behind these regulations is about bringing costs down and preventing the extreme variability of railway infrastructure across Europe. It's not necessarily about getting one train from um, the south of Italy up through the Alps over through France and into Great Britain. Um, it's more about having a similar, almost similar direct approach to specifications such that the market would be um, so wouldn't be too diverse and that the cost of delivering infrastructure would be brought down through standardization uh, and the role that we fulfill in ORR is to ensure that network rail duty holders so Roscoe's who are bringing uh, new running stock into operation through train operators we ensure that both rolling stock and um, infrastructure adheres to the regulations and the specifications as laid out in the interoperability regs. 
uh, and Dermot's team spends a lot of time uh, in early engagement reviewing uh, infrastructure works, particularly in the Midlands, Dermot, um, yeah. to ensure that they are compliant to the regulations and we're not compliant, that there's adequate mitigations in place, that the common safety method of risk assessment has been adopted and there's justification for any deviation at which point when Dermot's satisfied the files are presented to me and there's a recommendation that uh, on behalf of Ian Prosser uh, the, the chief inspector um, that everything is as it should be and that it's acceptable for us to sign off the request to enter into service um, and that's what we do and then the authorization is not about giving authority to open a station or to run the train quite yet. It's to enable the duty holder to follow its own safety management system to take it into service. Have I missed anything, Dermot? Try to keep it high. I don't. I don't think so. I think that covers it. Uh, so we're not checkers. Uh, we really. Uh, are very to ensure that uh, a due process is followed and that a due process is in place. Although at times we have had to delve in and cause a little bit of <laughs> friction, um, but that's because of our impartiality, going back to the earlier question, without us being impartial and the conscience of network rail project managers, um, things could be amiss and so we don't want that to happen. Okay. Do you want to talk about the periodic review? So I've touched on it already. So the periodic review it, it goes simply, I'm conscious that we're running out of time and I want people to have the opportunity to ask questions. The periodic review is something where the government, after consultation of stakeholders, including ourselves, um, offering advice and in discussions with Network Rail, determine what they think they wish to get out of the next control period, which is a five year span. Um, and, and in understanding what the DFT wishes to achieve um, through in, uh, investment in the next control period, together with the constraints of the funds available. So there's a SOFA, Statement of Funds Available. The ORR works with Network Rail to test its top down and bottom up approach to responding to the HLOS, which is the high level output specification. Um, determined by the DFT and it's an iterative process which takes about two and a half, three years. So we reach a point where we're confident that Network Rail, the duty holder, has plans that will meet to best value uh, the requirements as laid out in the H loss, which is their output spec. Okay. Uh, so our role in uh, asset management planning uh, sort of moves for three stages uh scrutiny challenge and monitoring uh so it follows through through the business drivers you know what the requirements are the customer requirements the legal financial business environment we see how that flows through to asset policy uh whether it delivers the whole lowest whole life cost greatest value how the policies uh, merge into the strategic plan life cycle delivery and finally outputs uh, where we're doing our monitoring. Uh, our assurance approach for CP6, uh, do you want to say anything yeah, about this? So, uh, so we mentioned that we're a small team and um, have oversight over 40,000 people. It's impossible for us to uh, take over as managers. It's just, just incomprehensible, the idea that we would ever expect ORR to manage the infrastructure. So what we have to do is be uh, targeted in our approach to ensure that uh, things are as they should be. And targeted assurance reviews, which are referred there, are a means for us to do that. Now that might be for us to do an investigation in something we have concerns about, but also it might be we just want to validate that things are as they should be. So they can be a good news investigation or a not so good news investigation and we undertake these on a risk and priority basis. Uh, um, uh, routine okay. assurance, yes. So we have regular engagement at regional level, at route level and at depot level, less so at depot level where we're more targeted. And we equally engage with the centre, uh, specifically technical assurance and their, uh, their policy setters. 
uh, and their own regulatory team. Um, now, Network Rail undertakes its, its own assurance uh, it's from the centre of the regions and the routes, uh, and we assure ourselves um, by reviewing the centre's assurance activity. The centre assures the assurance of the region and the route, and it cascades down to a level one assurance where there should be a great deal of um, uh, frontline self assurance. So that there are multiple tiers. I think I've yeah, sort I think, of just on that. Yeah, uh, the, the, this slide I think uh, talks about the three different levels of uh, assurance. Uh, so the definition of assurance is to confirm through independent appraisal and advisory activities that Network Rail is complying with their network license conditions and agreed outcomes within the control period. Uh, so as you can see, Network Rail do a lot of uh, internal assurance, uh, and then we do the fourth level uh, external assurance. Uh, so uh, assurance uh, consists really of uh, routine monitoring and uh, assessment. Uh, investigation and early resolution and enforcement and you'll recognize that from a, a slide earlier on uh, but the thinking and approach is developing all the time and the approach we have uh, in CP6 uh, you can see how is built upon uh, previous work done uh, in previous control periods and how we've added uh, more onto it so comparisons between routes agreed scorecards uh, regulatory minimum floors, for example. Uh, we review the strength of the route and the system operator accountability. Uh, uh, we also do more in investigation and early resolution. So uh, we would gather in depth more information and we can use independent reporters, which we'll come to in a minute. Uh, and then we've got our usual enforcement orders but we've now got regulatory fan financial sanctions and financial penalties uh, as well. Uh, so one of our assurance processes is the targeted assurance review. And we would do these uh, either internally or we would use a consultant to do it for us. All of our assurance reviews have to be risk-based. We keep a, a very big detailed register of where we see risks which we keep up to date and uh, we're constantly uh, reviewing that to make sure we're identifying where we see risks are and that could be to performance or risks to costs or risk to volumes uh, and examples of work we've done in that have been uh, particularly relevant to track will be the introduction of a rail miller we did a, uh, an assurance review of that last year and we'll be following that up this year to see that rail milling is delivering the benefits promised, uh, not just in terms of uh, rail life, uh, but also the costs are what was expected. Uh, we've also done a retargeted assurance review into SNC refurbishment uh, and uh, made some recommendations and areas for network rail to improve, uh, improve on. And uh, we've also done a uh, assurance review into level one structural examinations by Network Rail to give ourselves confidence that uh, that, pro that system is fit for purpose. Uh, do you want to talk about this independent yeah, report? And I'm conscious that we're running out of time, so I'll, I'll be very quick on this. Basically, as part of the license, Network Rail needs to provide uh, funding such that um, both Network Rail, in agreement with ORR, can uh, at our behest undertake independent assessment um, being the independent reporter which is often a uh, consultancy uh, that acts independently of ORR and uh, Network Rail to investigate any particular issues. Okay, Oops. Uh, do you want to talk about the escalator? So the escalator is a means by which it's the naughty step. It's our economic naughty step, and it's part of uh, the escalatory process of applying our home to account policy, whereby um, it helps us bring to the network rail's attention that, look, guys, in this particular area, you are on the naughty step, and it might be at level one naughty step or at the top of the escalator. 
and there are a number of activities that can can kick in if network rail don't uh, respond positively if something is at the very high level of the escalator that does mean that we may take some legal means um, to penalize um, whoever it might be within the organization and network rail are very conscious of that escalator and it's a reputational thing that they, and that they do not like to be on it okay and then of course on the health and safety side uh, if we have concerns about circumstances we investigate and if there's sufficient evidence of a breach in law we can uh, serve an improvement notice requiring improvement within a certain time scale we can serve a prohibition notice requiring immediate stopping of operations or work until an issue has been uh, addressed or resolved and finally we can prosecute in the magistrates or crown court uh, and the successful prosecution can lead to heavy fines uh, yeah. in Scotland. Sorry Dem, I was going to say in our inspectors hold warrant cards uh, additional powers over and above those that we have in the economic world. Okay, uh, I'll jump this one. Uh, so future uh, predictions are difficult uh, and they're particularly difficult when the future is involved. So I think broadly uh, the themes we are seeing uh, that we'd be concerned about are sustainability, decarbonisation and probably climate change, Steve? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yes, the, you know, we've seen it. We can't discuss details of Stonehaven, um, but there have been a number of extreme weather events that have taken place and the frequency of them we've evidenced is increasing markedly so so we do need to make sure that um, assets are adapted and more resilient to uh, the changing climate climate and the greater frequency of major events weather events okay and almost bang to a minute that takes us to the end uh, in the interest of transparency uh, go to our website and there is uh, bucket loads of information there uh, but if you have any questions, uh, I'll hand back to Paul now and uh, we'll see if we can answer them. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Stephen Dermot. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, that's, that's a, a fascinating presentation and uh, the com very, very well um, put across the complexities of um, uh, the ORR's role in uh, regulating the. Um, uh, the UK rail industry. So, so very, very many thanks for, for that as well. And uh, some very interesting sort of um, connections with projects that we've been working, that we as a team sort of have had contact with in terms of some of the, uh, the rail milling and the SNC refurbishment uh, assurance reviews that, that you guys have been undertaking. So it's quite close to home there. So, yeah. So thank you very much for that. I think uh, the the, I, I will um, just open to questions now. Um, I've got one question here from Paul Ebert, uh, who is asking, who does the economic regulation for TFL and other metros and light rail? Um, I don't know about the economic regulation of TFL. It's not ORR. Um, and it's not ORR for metros and light rail. However, we do full, fulfil a role from our health and safety in, inspectorate for both of those. Dermot, I don't know if you're more informed. Well, it was the mayor, wasn't it, for TFL uh, until COVID uh, created problems. And then I think some of the light rail and metro systems would be the uh, local authorities, uh, like GMT, uh, Gumpty. Greater Manchester Passenger Transport Executive, uh, those type of bodies. Yeah. Okay, thanks. For that. I've got a question myself because I, I picked up on um, something that you, th that you said about um, uh, network rail projects. I'm, I'm just, I'm just wondering how. Um, and obviously, you've got to be careful what you say, uh, but. I've, I'm just wondering how you find um, the challenges or whether you find the network rails fairly regular restructuring and, and um, organisational change um, uh, a challenge. Uh, definitely a challenge. I think any change results in turbulence and, and challenges. Uh, I think the question 
uh, is to, are we accepting of that turbulence and those challenges? And I would say putting passenger first and freight um, is justifiable. And, and I think a good way to validate that would be our investigations into Northwest and Central with poor train performance around the West Midlands and in the uh, Northern Corridor. Dermot, anything to add? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, in fairness to Network Rail, they do make an effort to uh, let us know what's going on, and they do brief us in some detail about changes they're planning. And uh, so, in my 18 months, I don't think anything's come as a surprise as such. Yeah, it's systematically assessed, and it needs to be um, signed off by our safety inspectorate so that, you know, for mitigations, risk, risk assessments through transition um, are identified. Um, and it's pretty well controlled, although any change can be turbulent. Sure, excellent. Okay. Um, just another minute or so for uh, any more questions. Has anybody else got any questions? Does the, so we've only had the one from Paul. Uh, in the chat, I think, unless someone can say otherwise. Dare I ask if, if there are any track questions? Ah. If there is, I'll ask Dermot to answer. <laughs> no, I think, uh, I think. I was just going to say, given that there's Hello? only a few, a few people, it's Kate. Hi, Kate from the PWA. Just given that there's just Hi, a Kate. few, I don't know if uh, people would like to unmute to ask a question uh, rather than typing their question, just as a different option. Uh, yes, yeah, Paul Ebert would like to ask another question. Okay. Is that Hello, Paul. Yeah. Hello. Uh, uh, just a link to this really good uh, series of lectures to do with automatic railways that the PWI is uh, sharing with uh, mechanical engineers and others. Uh, do you have any influence on whether it's appropriate to have uh, these automatic, of which they, I'm now an expert, of course, uh, called a GOA4 type railway, or whether it should be GOA3, etc.? We we cannot influence, but from um, probably from a way that you would not have expected. Um, and that is, we're assisting DFT and working with um, Network Rail to look at how effective the development of um, schemes are, are, are taken through. And, uh, and the basis of that would be restoring your railway, the old beaching lines, uh, and looking to see, are there suitable um, tools in place and available? Um, we think there could be more. Uh, and we're working with our rail and um, DFT to produce these, such that those um, clients are able to be clear about the outputs that they're after and not necessarily say how. And so often um, the industry delves to high speed rail when actually um, light rail and alternative modes may be the best solution. So we're influencing that. Um, discussion point by assisting in ensuring that the, the right tools in place and available for um, for clients and, and those developing projects for them. We do see that um, too rapidly um, um, consultants dive straight into heavy rail when it's just not necessary. That's interesting. That, that was a very interesting comment. Thanks for that. Yeah. Okay. Um... Right, okay. Uh, a question from Alexander Baldwin. Uh, what is the role of the ORR in changes to track de bed design approach? Um, especially, uh, in particular, the NR developing their design to adapt to cli climate change. So, so we wouldn't um, uh, influence in an exacting nature to the particular design itself. But what we do from a high level is promote and ensure that Network Rail do um, improve and evolve designs such that it can keep pace um, with climatic change. So, so we do drive and push uh, climatic change uh, and 
uh, ad resilience and ad adaptation planning. Um, and also we have a oversight of the governance of research and development. So although we wouldn't be individually involved in a specific design, we are very heavily involved in driving the approach to get new adaptive designs. Yes, so it's, it's something we would probably feel uh, confident to challenge on in terms of asking questions about uh, how sustainable the design was, uh, what re re resilience or climate change adaption was introduced into it, uh, how it was being uh, looked at in terms of whole life cost and uh, ongoing life and uh, maintainability, for example. Yeah. Uh, and increasingly, we'd be interested in how it works as a, within the railway system. Okay, brilliant. Um, any more? Any more questions, please? Final few seconds. Uh, uh, can I put okay. another, If anybody does think of something after this event and just didn't feel compelled to ask, Dermot and I would quite happily, um, after this session, uh, respond to any queries that you might you might want to send through. Excellent. Thanks for that, Steve. Uh, thanks, Dermot. Um, so, okay. only remains for me now uh, to hand over to Joss, who is going to do a um, uh, the vote of thanks in the traditional way. I think in the traditional way would be a stretch of uh, uh, online technology by some means. Taking you guys Very to good. the bar and up buying you both a drink or offering you some other form of refreshment before you take your long journey home, uh, whilst uh, offering you, um, you know, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the traditional way of thanks is going to be different, but um, it's still with the same, um, same purpose, the same meaning, the same, you know, genuine thanks for what you've presented today, which is an excellent presentation. Uh, there are things in there that I understood and there are things that I didn't and there are things that I've learned. Um, I frankly don't know how you get all the work done uh, with uh, the limited resource, but I guess that's a day-to-day -day challenge for all of you uh, that are working in the ORR. Uh, you know, as a committee group in um, PWI Nuts and Darby, we've known Dermot for many, many years. Uh, and obviously this is a new role for Dermot um, in his uh, long career in the railway. So um, it's good to see that people can take on new roles and challenges as well. So thank you for bringing that to uh, that to our group. So I, I keep it brief, but you know, genuinely, I wish I was face to face. I wish I could uh, shake your hand and say thank you very much, stand at the front and um, offer everybody the opportunity to say thank you um, Steve and Dermot for a thoroughly um, uh, well presented uh, evening. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Thank and you. a silent nod is more than acceptable, but I would like to take a rain check on that beer. You're very <laughs> welcome. Absolutely. I'll second that as well. So, uh, yes, we'll have to set, sort that out, set, set that up in the, uh, in the future. So, um, yeah, second exactly what uh, Joss has um, uh, said. So um, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this again. If we can just everybody unmute themselves, and if we just just have a, a quick round of applause, and that would be uh, that would be great.